Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Karen Bloom, and I am the Director of Engagement for Middleton Place Foundation. You might recognize my voice because I'm usually back there behind the camera. Um, welcome to Plugged Into History. We have a really important Let's, Let's Talk Tuesday for you today, and I'm so pleased to be joined by Tracy Todd, President and CEO of the Middleton Place Foundation, and Lee Pringle, who is a descendant of Middleton Place. He is a Board of Trustees member, and he is the founder and director of the Color of Music Festival, which originated right here in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I know that last week we were talking about and joking about that this week was going to be Diseases Week. Um, we are still dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, but we have put that programming for that week on hold. Uh, there is something much more pressing and much more important that we need to address and talk about today um, and in the coming months. So as Plugged Into History changes a little bit, and I'll tell you more about that in a video later on today, um, we are going to go to a new format and a new time, and we're going to have monthly themes. And this month, the theme was already set. It was going to, it is going to be centered around Juneteenth and Black history because Black history is American history and history is what we are all about here. So with that in mind, we have some really important things to discuss. There has been a lot of unrest and frustration and sadness and pain that has come to a head here in America today and we want to talk about that. It's important. We need to talk about that. So we're going to relate what Middleton Place has to offer and share how that connects to the history that is being made even now, even as we speak. And I'd like to start off with Lee, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and being uh, your experience of being a descendant and a board member here and um, how, how you find things happening today. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Tracy, for uh, your leadership as the CEO of Middleton Place Foundation. You know, I will give a disclaimer that I'm not a historian, but I'm a lover of history. And uh, growing up, I always knew from family members and those who were interested in genealogy that we were connected to the Middletons. Um, but it wasn't until 2008 when my family decided to do a reunion. And by that time, Ancestry.com and a lot of genealogy departments had been established in libraries. You were able to go and do a deep dive and learn a little bit more of how you were connected. And before we came on camera, Tracy and I were talking about reconstruction and how Middleton Pringle uh, would have been someone who would have had the right to vote and that right was taken away after um, the uh, uh, provisions that had been, been put in place after the abolishment of slavery, uh, but it was all taken away. So I will share that uh, the internationally renowned artist Jonathan Green was the person who actually asked me to connect the ancestry with being a member of the Board of Trustees. And I don't typically join boards unless my elbows can be on the table and I can go to work. Uh, because I truly believe if you're gonna be on a board, you should be doing the grunt work and all the things that benefit the mission statement of an organization. Thanks to Charles Duell, the founder, who retired uh, going on two years now and turned the reins over to Tracy, who, is, who was his chief operating officer at the time. There's a continuity that I'm very proud to be a part of. And I say that because you cannot articulate black history or white history in North America and detach them. It's just not capable. I mean, we know that the Native Americans, this was their land. And we know how slaves were brought here. And Tracy, the historian that he is, will probably go a little bit deeper into that. But I say I'm proud to be a part of an organization who took the lead among many interpretive museums and sites to tell the truth. 
And if there's anything, uh, we just recently had a board member and this discussion came up because it's so relevant to what's going on in America. And there's just no way as a board we could just ignore it. And so I want to thank not only the board, but more importantly, the leadership of this um, historic institution for saying, you know, we're not going to go and hide in a corner about the fact that Middleton Place and all the plantations that were owned, a total of 19, if my memory serves me correct, the vast majority here in South Carolina, but going as far north as uh, the York area near Charlotte and out towards Georgia, you cannot ignore the fact that our shared history is so interwoven. Everything that we're experiencing today, the unrest, the systemic racism that is just a part of the DNA of how America was built, you can't ignore it. So I want to thank, um, you know, Caroline and June Duell. They're the daughters of Charlie Duell for um, also being very forthcoming with why they felt that the Middleton Place Foundation needed to be a pace setter and needed to be aggressive on saying, <clears throat> we're gonna get in front of the story right now and not hide behind it. So um, I hope that my participation as a board member and helping Middleton with many of the objectives that, that they have to tell the story from the enslaved's perspective not the beautiful gardens and so forth, but who built the gardens and how the gardens became what they are. Those things are very important. Sure. Well, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. I look forward to hearing more from you. Um, really quick, everybody, if you have any questions for anyone who's talking today, don't forget to put them in the comments. We will answer them as they come in. All right. So, Tracy, can you give us a little bit of um, the history, the baseline history that Lee is talking about and how we can look at the really early foundations of these systems that have been put in place and how that relates to Middleton Place specifically. Sure, sure. Hey, hey hello everyone. Uh, good to be back with you on Facebook Live. Again, Tracy Todd, Middleton Place Foundation President and CEO. Um, I, you know, before before we get into that, I just wanted to say I, I'll never forget the day that Lee and I met. It was it was a day that uh, my, we were at a we were at a, a, a gathering at the Edmonston Austin House for Volvo yes. when Volvo was first coming to town, town yeah. and uh, and everyone was celebrating this kind of momentous event for the Low Country, and my wife came up to me on the on the piazza and she said, Tracy, there's a guy you've got to meet. He says his great-grandfather's name was Middleton Pringle. And I said, what? Because she knew that here at Middleton Place, uh, we're very interested in finding out these connections and learning who the descendants, uh, living descendants of Middleton's, Middleton's are today. Uh, and so we, we immediately uh, went to meet Lee there on the piazza. And it's kind of hard for us to sit this far apart, like, you know, right now, because that was only a few years ago, but we feel like we've known each other forever. Yeah, um, so Lee's, Lee's connection is very special, uh, being a Middleton descendant uh, uh, in the enslaved community. And, and, the, and his great-grandfather, Middleton Pringle, is a, is a terrific example of this conversation we were having earlier about disenfranchisement and how it happened in, in South Carolina. Um, not only, of course, what did we have uh, this system of slavery that, that, that uh, prevented um, generational wealth, uh, but after the Civil War, when the, when the first Constitution was, was put in place in 1868, it, it gave... The you first know, state Constitution. First state there Constitution. You go. We're talking about the state of South Carolina. South Carolina. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Uh, <laughs> keeps, Karen keeps me straight. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. <laughs> we just want to make sure we know what we're talking about. So, first state Constitution, 1868. Go. Right. <laughs> and, and so, it, it gave... Um, Unfortunately, not women, but all men, uh, the, the right to vote. And, and African Americans um, became very involved in the political process, including, you know, including Middleton Pringle, uh, Lee's, Lee's great-great-grandfather. And it's just amazing to think about that period of time when the state legislature in South Carolina was actually dominated by African Americans, uh, 
but they held a majority in both houses. They have the lieutenant governor, the secretary of state, and these the largest offices. population. We outnumbered, right? Boston. Because South Carolina was well, a yeah. majority black uh, state at that point. Yeah. Um, and and uh, you know, historians and I like to just kind of ponder: what if? You know, what if? What if? What if that constitution had never been overturned? That would be an interesting would be an interesting place. But unfortunately, that constitution was changed in 1898. And Middleton Pringles' right to vote was taken away. It's taken away, yeah. And you know um, that eleven-year period between the abolishment of slavery and Reconstruction, and in the Charleston area, for most of the locals, they're very familiar with people like Robert Smalls, okay, right. who um, was from Beaufort, and the history of what he was able to do commandeering a, uh, a naval vessel, and uh, you know that dives a little deeper into where we were at the time, and he was among many black legislators at the time that, that made history. And as Tracy indicated, um, during that time frame of, of that state constitution being overturned, you know, if you were a black legislator and you lived through it, you were one lucky person yeah. because they all were literally almost murdered. I mean, the whole there was a whole slew of them that were murdered because of laws being acted to pre prevent them from having that political power. And, you know, it, all these things are interconnected, you know, the Carolina colony and how we fit into American history and having so many framers of our Constitution, you know, having the wealth that gave them that type of, you know, aristocratic or, or uh, position in life to be major, major contributors in the America that we know today. Uh, lands like this, okay, granted you that kind of access. Um, and I got a chance to see what Middleton Place Foundation's commitment to the other story when Tracy and I, two years ago, uh, he invited me to join him uh, for a two and a half day uh, session at Montpelier and seeing, in my opinion, I'm a little biased, <laughs> how far ahead we were compared to other interpretive sites throughout America. And this was CEOs from literally every major monumental American site. And, you know, we were a standout and where we were, what we were doing, what the staff was involved with on a daily basis. And so we have this unique history, and, and as we talked about on a, in our recent board meeting, the board of directors, we have an enormous asset, which I, and I would hope that in some form or fashion, if you haven't already, he can be uh, one of the guests. Because if you ever come to South Carolina, which we hope you do if you're watching from abroad mm -hmm. to come at these beautiful grounds. The gentleman who maintains these grounds for how many years? 40, 60? Sidney Frazier, <clears throat> Vice President of Horticulture. Yeah. He started here when he was about 18 years old. And uh, he's a celebrating a, something like 45 years. I thought it was 45 or 46 yeah. years. And I just ran into him when I was coming in before filming. and. Uh, you know, not only does it give me great pride to see someone um, who represents what Middleton is, Middleton Place Foundation is about, but you know, an African American man who started out, you know, in his teens, being a visionary to understand that as minuscule as his 18-year-old job might have been at the time, <laughs> to stay the course because of the founders' respect for what people like um, uh, Mr. Frazier brought to, um, to Middleton Place. I don't want it to, to, to just kind of, not that the staff has ever done this, but I want people to know that our history is so deep that if you, you just take a look, sometimes you'll be surprised uh, from you know, Jamal, who uh, is a part of the interpretive um, right. portion of our uh, you know, who, who's a college-educated Temple University, 
you know, young man who just loves history, uh, a musician on top of that. And, you know, being able to, to talk and mingle with and get a sense of, you know, of all the things you could be doing, you know, why maintaining the grounds of this once in a lifetime, you know, butterfly garden and all these uh, English components that make the gardens at Middleton Place, you know, one of the most unique treasures in America. It's because when Charles Duell decided to formalize what these grounds would be and create this foundation 40 plus years now, uh, he understood that for Middleton to really show its truth, it was going to require all these components, including things that some people might not understand. You know, watching a young black educated person, you know, interpreting blacksmithing is something that most people, if you don't understand the craft and what blacksmithing meant to this colony, you know, it was one of the things that if you were a wealthy landowner, your gardens reflected all the architectural elements that the English kind of set the standard for. And the people who were doing that were the ones who could handle the malaria, handle the heat. And so the, those are things that I, I think that if you come to Middleton Place, there's a whole going living history that you can explore. And, and Lee, um, Jamal is a fantastic interpreter, and, and a, lot of, a lot of you in the audience probably know Jamal. He's really standing on the shoulders of people yes. before him, like Philip Simmons, the great Charleston blacksmith who was here at Middleton Place and helped you know, develop the, the blacksmith shop that's there now. Wow. Yeah. And we talk about, you know, you talked a lot about the foundation as um, a, a whole comprised of a lot of different components, not all of which some people would understand, but I, I'd like to think that one of the goals of the creation of the foundation was to be a resource for people. Yeah. Um, and I would just like to ask if you would consider that uh, we are that, that we have, you know, accomplished that goal, but that we are continuing to improve that. I mean, every, every interpretive site needs um, improvement, needs evolution, needs, you know, narrative change. Um, but, you know, I do want it, and I, I hope you would agree that I do want it understood that we are meant to be here as a resource for people. Um, and, I, and I would agree that, um, you know, there's so much um, history that uh, the founder uncovered when he inherited this property, and who's an avid writer as well, um, that uh, I hope, you know, someday Charles will put pen to paper and uh, share some of it. You know, Tracy knows a lot of it by oral history, and he's a, a reader as well. But you know, there aren't many places in America that you can um, come to and have a resource like a Middleton place. Um, most people know the, the settlement at Jamestown, where in 1619, which some scholars would say it was before then, but 1619 is when you know the first African. You know, hit the shores and uh, started something that would become, you know, the topic of discussion 401 years later. Right. right. Okay, 401 years later, uh, because I think it was last year where the 400th anniversary was celebrated. It was, yeah. yeah. 1619. 1619, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, I, 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 you know, because I love history, I mean, I was totally, you know, connected to that. But one of the things you hear, folks say a lot, if you don't know your history, you are destined to repeat the bad things about your history. And I would submit, and some may disagree with me, there are so many people in the white community that don't know their history, don't even know how they became a part of the problem that is sure. some systematic racism that is just built in to so many institutions in the United States. Um, you know, from every way we, we do poli policing, um, 
the aggressive nature of what American policing is about compared to other countries, many of whom were civilized Western countries before we were, who don't even carry guns. Or, you know, a murder beyond, you know, somebody having some altercations is rarely heard of in policing. So, and Lee, I just want to jump in sure. real quick. Yeah. Um, that just brings this. One of my teachers, uh, Dr. Bernard Powers, yes. at the College of Charleston, uh, he's a one of he's sort of my historical hero. But <laughs> he pointed out to me once, and in the in the black codes that were you know in existence in the 18th and 19th century, there were phrases like that any white person could stop a black person on the street. You know, and think about that language mm -hmm. that. Uh, was part of the law in, in the 1800s. Uh, any white person could stop a black person, no matter what that black person was doing. Well, that seems and, to still be inherent today, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it, as I said, if you don't know your history, you're destined to repeat the bad parts of the history. Well, and that's a great point. And so I have a question. How can we be a better resource, not just for history, but when a community is hurting? When we hear about George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, what can Middleton Place Foundation give to people? If they're looking for community resources, and we want to be that, we want to be a place where people can come and connect, connect with history, connect with each other. And so what can we do? I think Middleton Place Foundation has continued to reinvent the shared history that we have as black and white Americans. And the foundation is committed to education and community engagement is what you do. Yes. <laughs> That's your main job description. Um, I would encourage, if you have not visited Middleton Place, come to Eliza's house right. and look at the recording of every enslaved person name, literally. So the foundation put every enslaved person's name on this massive placard that shares what Middleton Place's true history is. And walk through the Bidocks and go down to the Butterfly and go to the English Gardens and see if you're African American or if you're white, what black labor created for an economic engine that continues to have statistical data that shows a, a, a stark disparity between black wealth and white wealth. And all those things are interconnected to the shared history that we have where the average white person who don't know their history are clueless that the ability to own real estate and the ability not to own real estate for multi-generations builds into it a wealth transfer that gives these stark numbers when you compare white wealth and black wealth. And these are things that are still a part of our American system today, which leads into health disparities, education disparities. There is not one statistical you know, focus that you can look at that doesn't come back to how we were started as a nation. And Lee, I, I, that just reminds me of, you know, being on the, the, walking through the gardens and in the house museum in the state of Weyards, you encounter lots of guests and, and people ask questions. And one of the number one questions that people ask at Middleton Place is, were the Middletons good to their slaves? It, it's, it is literally a question that our interpreters here answer on a daily basis almost, uh, if not daily. Um, and I get it at, when I walk around, um, and it's one of my favorite questions actually to get. And I liked it because it opens the door to this conversation that good and bad are really not, ver they're, they're not adjectives that we should be using here, but whether they were good or bad is irrelevant. That's right. They're because right because <laughs> the system itself yeah. Even for the most benevolent owner, the system itself created 
a, 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 a whole class of people that, that could not build wealth, could not pass that, could not build their own wealth, could not pass down generational wealth well, to their children. children yeah. um, and here we are in the 21st century with uh, a large segment of the population that had been held back for so long because of slavery. And then after the war, as we talked about, having, having small periods when they could vote and when things were pro progressing politically, and then have the, the, the curtain pulled from under you there in the late 1800s, leading into segregation and Jim Crow, Jim Crow. And, here, and here we are today. So history really does affect us today. Yeah. I, uh, you know, on social media, um, I will engage uh, respectfully with uh, opposing uh, uh, views on the political spectrum. And I would submit both Middleton Place Foundation and my organization, the Color Music Festival, we are non-political <laughs> because we want everybody to be engaged in, certainly as it relates to classical music and black contributions to classical music, we want the white audience as well as the black audience and the brown audience and every other ethnic group to come experience something that continues to be one of the last glass ceilings of that system that was brought into it. Classical music, operas, ballets, those things were created to exclude people of African ancestry. If anything, the folks of African ancestry was providing the entertainment for um, a lot of what transpired in the 1600s when classical music got its origin in, in Italy. And so, you know, one of the things that we put out today, my organization, was the fact that, you know, unlike the 2,000 American orchestras, and most Americans don't even know that 2,000 orchestras are registered with the League of American Orchestras, but among those 2,000, <laughs> among those 2,000, people of African ancestry literally represent less than 2% of the folks yeah. who actually take the stage. Marian Anderson cracked the ceiling by being the first black person to be respected by the establishment. But if you go to the top 10 American orchestras, just think of all the major cities we have, you will not find anyone or maybe one or two in the top 20 American orchestras because of a system that has been in place since the European construct of classical music was brought over to the continent of North America. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because that seems to me a brilliant example of how people don't understand fully what racism is. People who think that racism is only a conscious choice or action and who don't understand that systems are built and created that we are sort of born into and funneled into that we don't make conscious choices about but that we benefit from. And I think that that is an incredible example of of being black in a white space. In a white space, it, it is. And, and you know, I will you know get off of my classical music uh, soapbox here because for eight years, um, I've been um, I don't want to use the word fighting the battle, but I've been uh, going against the, the the grain or swimming upstream. If you go to the top foundations who grant funding to classical organizations. I would be surprised if the CEOs of those foundations could substantiate how much of that money actually goes to black contributions to classical music, opera, and ballet. Mm -hmm. The system is set up by those who put parameters in place to indirectly, and I would say sometimes directly, to not allow black institutions to, get, to, to gain footing. The historically black college, I think, is one of the, the best examples of how you can change a multi-generational trajectory by simply giving colleges that were created to keep us away from white institutions. I mean, it's just 
as blatant as that, there's 105 of them left. And we're expected, historical black colleges are, ex are expected to compete on par with white institutions that have been endowed by the very money that was taken from the black communities by laws. I I'll go as far as saying redlining and determining you know, who can get loans even down to our armed services being ahead of society, implementing rules and regulations that the majority white population in the Army and the Navy refused mm -hmm. to allow to happen. And I'm just going to say this one last thing about that and, and allow you to move on. You know, I'm an ex-sailor. I spent eight years in the U.S. Navy. And I just read an article um, that talked about the first 16 black naval officers. So think about this, you have historically black colleges educating people, many of whom got classical educations at these institutions, who were relegated to be an enlisted person in our armed services, Army, Navy. And these are our crown jewels of military. You know, the Air Force and Coast Guard, these are things that came much later. But the Army and the Navy is at the very core of our creation as as a, a, as a nation, but yet it was literally in the 40s and 50s where we still did not allow black soldiers and sailors to become commissioned naval officers. So this article chronicles all these, these, these black uh, youth who were the experiment and against all odds they became the first. I think it, it narrowed down to 10 of them that had actually got a commission. Somebody was given the status of a chief warrant officer. But these are all the things that, you know, when you don't know your history, you don't understand why there are these huge gaps in disparity. Right. Well, sure. I mean, this is why, you know, this is one of the reasons I like to think that the foundation exists because if we talk about these systems that are set up that are the unconscious racism and unconscious bias and then you add to that those overt mm -hmm. feelings those overt actions those intentional pieces of racism that are still uh, very prevalent today um, it is a mind-blowing thing to try and reconcile and try to understand from someone else's perspective from my perspective um, it's difficult to think about walking in those shoes. Yeah, and, and that's why I think, uh, not to cut you off, why no, no. The, uh, you know, the audience needs to know why it's so important to have succession planning where a vision and a mission has continuity. And uh, as Tracy was talking about earlier, from the day we met at the uh, Edmondson Austin House at 21 East Bay, which is a, a, a home owned by the foundation, um, and it's a museum, uh, we have somewhat been tethered in some form or fashion, not always agreeing on approaches, but we have, you know, the utmost respect. I think sometimes I might be a little more aggressive on, on what I feel is uh, a uh, contribution to a particular situation, um, because after all, we are the sum of our life experiences, and uh, one of the reasons why we decided to do this together is because we wanted to make sure that we gave a truthful interpretation of this discussion, not one of two black board members speaking for all black people as we're sure. you know, some type of monolith, because that is not the case. You know, I'm one person who have my life experiences, and uh, Jonathan Green, who's the other black uh, trustee at Middleton Place, uh, would have his. Uh, but I think all of us are, are here because when Charles turned it over to Tracy, we knew that there was going to be this continuity at Middleton Place to continue to have the, the, the rightful conversations, but sometimes uncomfortable conversations that you must have in order to be a nation or a society to move forward. So it goes back to our original discussion that if you have white history in America, you have black history in America. It is virtually impossible to separate them. And that's what I hope 
the viewers from today's discussion will, will take from it. Wow, <clears throat> Lee, that's that's a pretty good that's a pretty good thought to end with. But I just want to say we we really wanted to bring to, to have you and me together to, to to show our relationship as well. I mean, I think and you know, we've had a, we've had a great relationship the past few years, and it's it's really gotten deep. And of course, he. You know, he does challenge challenge me from time to time, and, and of course I challenge him. And you know, we're we're we're, uh, we're the best of friends and colleagues for it. And I, I just really appreciate Lee's input here at Middleton Place and his leadership um, and all that he brings to the table. It's it's just it's invaluable. We, we wouldn't be the same without it. Well, thank you, Tracy. Well, thank you both. We really appreciate it. Um, just want to reiterate that this place is important and it holds everyone's history. And if you are hurting from things that are happening now, um, we have a space for you here, dedicated to feel whatever kind of feelings. That contemplate, think about, pray. <laughs> yeah, sadness, so anger, yeah. respite. Mm -hmm. We want to be a resource for the community in that way and in a way where you can learn history and understand the foundations of these systems that places like Middleton Place represent. So um, thank you both so much for being here. Really appreciate you. We will certainly be talking with Sydney again. Thanks for bringing that up. He's been on the program before and we will yes. definitely bring him back for a little bit more. Um, everybody on Thursday, we are gonna hopefully continue this conversation in terms of connecting history and current events. We are going to get more perspectives on how we can move forward together and how Middleton Place Foundation can be a resource for you and for the community. And as we move forward with our June programming, remember that um, we, we did make a promise yesterday. We recommitted to doing our jobs and to doing them better which is a commitment that honestly we make to ourselves every day, but we feel like we needed to say out there to all of you. Um, and as we do that, and as we uh, continue to evolve our narratives and evolve our programming, things are gonna look a little weird right now because we are still in the middle of a pandemic. So if you come out and visit us and guided tours aren't exactly what they used to be, that's for our safety and for yours. Um, but rest assured that the narratives keep evolving, the interpretation keeps improving, and we want to continue to hear from you. We want your feedback, we want your suggestions, um, and we encourage you to engage. And so if you can't come out here and be with us this month for June Black History Month, because every month is History, Black History, History Month, month. <laughs> um, then if you can't participate live in person, for example, for Juneteenth, we'll be doing a whole set of programming smaller and safely, but we will be doing a set of programming for Juneteenth. If you can't be here for that, please use this platform. We have created Plugged Into History to be available to you digitally and from afar, so that if you can't join us, if you're worried about joining us, um, if the world's just not safe enough yet, that's okay. We are here through this device, and that's what we're hoping you will use to join us and to offer feedback. So. Um, all right, I've said enough. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Carrie. Thank Thanks you, Tracy. Thanks for being here. We'll Goodbye, see you on Thursday, everyone. 11 a.m.